Yeah, let's get started. I'd like to thank everyone who's joining us. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Debugging Your Debugging Tools, What to Do When Your Service Mesh Goes Down to Production. I'm Jerry Fallon, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We'd like to welcome our presenters today, Niraj Podar, co-founder and chief architect at Aspen Mesh, and John Howard, software engineer at Google. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not allowed to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct. Please be respectful of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that today's recording and slides will be posted later today at the CNCF webinar page at CNCF dot io slash webinars. With that, I'll hand it to Niraj and John to kick off today's presentation. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Neeraj. I'm the co-founder and chief architect at Aspen Mesh. I'm also the member of the Istio Technical Oversight Committee. With me, I have John. Uh, John, you want to introduce yourself? Hey, uh, yeah, I'm John Howard. Uh, I work on Istio at Google. Um, I work in the networking and environments and, and test and release areas mostly. Yep. So thanks everyone for joining us in this webinar on debugging your debugging tools, what to do when your service mesh goes down in production. It's great to see organizations adopting service meshes like Istio to gain business agility and scalability, but at the same time, it's important to ensure that the service mesh itself is available and resilient. And if and when issues happen, you can quickly debug and diagnose it. And that's the topic of discussion today. Uh, spe specifically, we're going to focus on Istio and how you can debug and diagnose it. I'm going to start with giving a brief overview of what a service mesh is and go over Istio's architecture as it's important to understand the architecture to be able to uh, easily debug and diagnose it. So let's get started. A service mesh is a transparent infrastructure layer. It manages and handles the communication between microservices. And as such, it allows developers to focus on the business logic and not worry about the application, worry about the infrastructure pieces. At the same time, it allows operators to work independent of the developer cycles and provide a more resilient and secure environment. This decoupling is one of the main benefits of a service mesh like Istio. Most of the service meshes work by adding a proxy, which transparently intercepts traffic going in and out of your application. And as the proxy intercepts traffic, it provides a lot of crucial functionality. These functionalities can be bucketed into three categories. Uh, traffic management includes things like path-based routing, connection management, request retries, and timeout, which now the application can offload into the service mesh. Security can include end-user authorization, authentication, or workload-to-workload -workload security like AuthZ and AuthN. And, and transparently encrypting traffic so you can delegate that functionality from your application to the service mesh. Along with that, as the proxy intercepts traffic, it emits a lot of rich contextual data, which can be used, telemetry data, which can be used to understand what is happening in your clusters. This includes tracing, uh, metrics, and logs. As you can see, a service mesh will provide a lot of crucial benefits. And as such, if you're relying on it, you want to make sure you can debug and diagnose it. So this is a high level overview of Istio's architecture. So in this, I'm showing how Istio's components interact with microservices running in your cluster. So in the bottom half of the slide, you will see three microservices, service A, B, and C. The green boxes represent the application container. Istio adds a sidecar, sidecar proxy container in the same pod as your application container. And that's what is shown in the pink boxes. The sidecar proxy container has two key components. Envoy, which is the CNCF or the cloud native proxy, uh, which allows you to, uh, enables you to have this functionality offloaded from your application around traffic management, security, and observability. And Istio agent is the process which is responsible for bootstrapping and a lot of other functionality that John is going to talk about later. So these sidecar proxies together is what we call the data plane of, of Istio. In the top half, you will see the control plane. The control plane is responsible for configuring and managing these sidecar proxies or the data plane. So they take in information from your Kubernetes environment, 
for example, it can take in your Kubernetes services and points along with all the Istio specific CRD resources that you create and lower it to the configuration that your sidecar proxies can understand. Uh, in the same way, if you're using TLS, it can be used for managing the life cycle of certificates. Istio 1.5 and before, the control pin itself used to be a distributed microservices architecture, as you can see. From 1.6 onwards, it has been consolidated into a monolithic control plane called Istio D. This was done for purely operational reasons for simplifying operation, uh, simplifying the operations and lifecycle management of Istio itself. The functionality remains the same. Along with it, you get an Istio ingress gateway and egress gateway. Uh, ingress gateway is used for getting traffic into your cluster and egress if you want to use for getting traffic out. Ingress and egress gateway for this uh, webinar is also part of the data plane. So as you can imagine, since Istio is logically separated into these components, if you want to effectively debug Istio, you have to first triage and understand whether the issue is with control plane or data plane. And, that, and in the same way, if you have figured out where the issue lies, then you have to understand if it's the issue in the Istio agent, if you're di diagnosing data plane or the sidecar, or is the issue with the Istio D itself. So I'm going to cover the various tools that are available for diagnosing Envoy. John is going to cover uh, tools for de uh, debugging Istio agent and Istio D. Then we are gonna talk about some common problems that users often see, and then give you like a debugging guide so that you can easily understand where the problem might be. And I'm gonna to try to end the presentation if we have some time, making some recommendations of what, how, what and how to run uh, Istio in production. So with that, let me get into debugging Envoy. So we are gonna talk about four key areas or four key things that you can use for debugging Envoy. First is you can verify whether Envoy can connect to Istio D. The second is understanding and enabling access logs, which have lots of rich information about the request flowing through the proxies. Third is enabling debug logging from Envoy itself. And fourth is understanding the configuration architecture in the design of Envoy. So you can look under the hood and understand if there are, there are issues in the data plane, if Envoy itself has been configured correctly by the control plane. <clears throat> For the first step, this is a simple command that you can run from your application container. This requires that the application container has curl and you can reach out to the Istio D process or the Istio D service and you can look at the debug Z endpoint. The endpoint here does not really matter. This is just a debug endpoint. But the main point here is to ensure that you have connectivity between the sidecar proxy and the control plane. As long as the, as long as the command gives you a 200 OK and some response, it ensures there is no problems with connectivity. On the other hand, if you're not able to connect to control plane, the problems you will see will be around, you are applying configuration, but the configuration is not taking into effect into the sidecar proxies or gateways. So this is just a quick check. If you have curl in your container, you can do it. The next piece is understanding application access logs. So access logs are records of requests or transactions which are flowing through the proxies, be it sidecar proxy or its ingress or egress gateways. Envoy can record rich information about the client and the server that is connected to the proxy and, info and it can give you information about the request itself. All of this information is super useful for diagnosing traffic flows and if there are failures to understand and spot check what the failure is related to. Additionally, I like to think of access logs as if you're looking through your microservices chain and if you look at access logs throughout these microservices, you can actually trace end to end what is happening to the request and if and when problems happen, where that problem is. By default, the access logs is turned off in Istio. It is only enabled in the demo profile. So if you're running it in production, this should be one of the things which you can turn on. And for me, this is one of the first tools in your toolkit to understand what is happening in service mesh in your applications. So this is how you globally enable access logs. So you can use your Istio CTL tool. If you're using Istio CTL install command to install it, you can set access log file uh, option in mesh config to dev standard out. And this enables access logs throughout your cluster for all the proxies, including sidecar and 
gateways. The default encoding for logs is text, which means that the logs that are spit out are the fields are separated by spaces. This is sometimes difficult to grog in production as what these fields mean, what the order means. You can change the access log encoding to JSON, which will give you a prettier version with key and the values together. The third command just tells you how to revert back to no access log. The key here is you have to have the access log file option as empty, and then you can go back to the encoding as text. I've often been asked by users and customers, how do I see what my current configuration is in the running cluster? So this option is stored in the config map in Istio, system namespace, and the config map is called Istio. You can grip for access log, you can see what your current option is. This next bit is about enabling access logs for a namespace if you don't want to turn it on for the entire cluster. You can use the Envoy filter resource that I have showed here. I have a link to a GitHub repository where you can download this sample. There are two key things to note here. Envoy filter API in Istio is a break glass API. So if you use it and if you incorrectly configure it, you can affect traffic throughout your cluster. So I always recommend using it in a demo namespace or use it in a demo cluster if you have access to a spare cluster. And the second important point is you should not use the Envoy filter option if you have turned it on globally. The way Envoy filter merge semantics work, you will end up with two logs instead of one. You can also use Envoy filter to turn on the logging at the workspace level by adding the appropriate workload selectors. So this is a quick sample of access log. I'm showing you the access log in JSON format. So you have the keys in the value pair. You can see a lot of request attributes like authority, path, protocol. Along with that, you have information about the client and the server that Envoy proxy connects to. In Envoy lingo, the client that connects to Envoy is downstream and the server to which the Envoy connects to is upstream. One key thing here to note is the response flags. A response flag attribute response flags contains a lot of information when errors happen. For example, when you get a 502 or a 503 response in HTTP, you might not be sure whether it came from your application or the proxy itself. So this flag is the one that you look for additional information if there are connection level errors. Specifically, you can use this to sometimes determine if there are TLS related issues if you are getting further ahead in your stack. So this is the information what is contained in the response flags. I have a link here to Envoy documentation which explains various fields. Some of them are common to both HTTP and TCP. One thing I want to note here is upstream connect, which comes for HTTP. You will see this often if there are any uh, connection level errors happening uh, and the upstream has disconnected. I've seen this uh, very, used effectively for debugging. Uh, similarly, if you have errors around uh, if you have uh, errors around uh, outlier detection, you will see upstream overflow, which, which can be useful to understand that you, you have a circuit breaking that is triggering these failures. So the next tool that you have is using debug logging. So debug logging is looking at internal logs of Envoy to understand what's going on. It's very verbose and expensive. We don't recommend it to use it for production usage. And that's why the default is warning. You can turn on the debug log for a specific workload without restarting it using the stuctl command. That is the preferred way, I would say, how you turn on debug logging. Otherwise, you will end up restarting the pod if you use the next two options by adding annotations or globally turning it on. This is specifically useful in various MTLS related issues where you might not even get to the stage where you get access log, but debug logs might give you some more information. The next tool is looking at Envoy configuration itself. So Envoy configuration is split into various logical components. So, and they are all composed, the configuration itself is composed of this chain where each of these components refer to each other by forward references. This gives a lot of flexibility by design where each of these components can be dynamically loaded without affecting the other. So for example, the rate of change of endpoints can be faster than the rate of change of listeners. So I'm gonna quickly go over what these fields are. Uh, listeners are the IP port tuple, which are similar to a server address or a socket address that you listen to. Any traffic that is received at Envoy will only be processed if there is a corresponding listener on it. When listeners are matched, if there are multiple that match the criteria, the most specific one is always picked. 
in Envoy, there are two kinds of listeners, or actually there are various kinds of listeners, but the two ones I want to talk about is one that actually bind to the socket. So they are actually uh, calling listen, and the other ones don't call bind, but they're used for matching criteria. Listeners point to filter chains. Filter chains have a, have a bunch of selection criteria for selecting the set of filters. The selection criteria can be based on destination IPs, ports, or for TLS, we use it for application protocols or SNI headers. Then filter chains branch out and point to filters. Filters are run always in order and any filter in the chain can terminate the processing. For example, an OTZ filter might reject processing if the user is not authorized. Filters can be HTTP or TCP. This is where the core decoding of the packet happens and understanding the and this is core to understanding the protocol that is being uh, that is being processed http filters point to routes routes are rules based on attributes of the request which tell you which cluster to send the traffic to in this case the most specific route is matched both routes and tcp filters in the way istio configures it eventually point to clusters clusters a symbolic name for destination servers and then clusters are itself made of endpoints and endpoints are the ip address and ports which represent those services upstream services that you are talking to so it's important to understand this hierarchy of configuration to effectively debug envoy so this is a quick example of how you can get access to listeners using istio ctl proxy con config command you can look at virtual inbound virtual outbound or outbound listeners these are the three kind of listeners that Istio currently configures. A virtual out, virtual inbound listener is the listener at port 15006 that accepts all traffic coming from outside of your pod into the pod. This listener has a bunch of filter chains which further selects based on destination IP and port and forwards traffic to the application on the local host. Virtual outbound listener is the opposite end. It's the listener on port 15000, which is the default fallback listener for traffic going from the application pod to the outside from, from the application pod to application container in the pod to outside of your pod this is only used if there is no specific outbound listener which gets matched which is the third type of listener so you can use the proxy config command to pick the listener you want and look at the details of how it has been configured you can also look at all the listeners by looking at by issuing the command which is the fourth command so if you are having traffic issues the First thing I always recommend is look at all the listeners without the dash o JSON, look at the IP and the port, and then based on what listener will be hit, you can look at the details of the specific listener by providing the address in the port option. So here's a quick example of an HTTP listener configuration. In this, you can see there's the socket address, the filter chains, and then the envoy.http connection manager is the one that makes it an HTTP listener. HTTP listeners, like I was saying, always point to routes. So you, you should be able to see a route config name, and then you can use the Istio CTL proxy config route command to look at the route. And similarly, you can follow the entire chain by following the diagram that I showed a few slides ago and look at the configuration and how it flows. This is a simple TCP listener. It's TCP because the TCP proxy listener is invoked and, and the TCP listeners point to clusters directly. So here is the name of the cluster. So people often ask me, how does various resources in the Kubernetes and Istio environment map to Envoy configuration, which is as I'm creating these resources, because Envoy has so many things, what do I look at? So this is a quick summary of how in Istio 1.6, these resources map to Envoy configuration. This changes for every release, but this is more or less kept consistent in the sense of these things will always be changed. They can be new things that are updated. So as new Kubernetes services are added, listeners, routes, or clusters, all of them can be, can be updated. We create listeners based on the service port and the port and the protocol prefix on the, on the basis of port and the protocol prefix uniqueness. So for HTTP service, we will create a wild, wildcard listener for that port and then have routes based on the host name for the virtual host. But for a TCP, protocol, the listener will be created based on a cluster IP and the port. Similarly, the cluster configuration in Envoy is based on the service port and the subset combination. The Kubernetes endpoints affect the endpoints of Envoy. 
uh, Istio gateway affects listeners, and this only applies to the ingress and the egress gateways. Virtual service and destination rule and service entry are the three configure are the three CRDs which affect the client side proxies. Virtual service affects listeners for TCP and TLS, but for HTTP it mostly affects uh, on way routes. Destination rule and service entry affects the cluster the client side configuration for clusters and endpoints. The next three CRDs, peer authentication, request authentication, and authorization policies, affect the server side proxies. Uh, they are mostly used for enforcing server side policies. So they are uh, they are invoked or they affect the listener configuration. Envoy filter, like I was saying, is a break glass API. So you can change almost all Envoy configuration and sidecar is depending on how you're using the sidecar, if you're using the Istio sidecar for scoping down the configuration, it can affect everything. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to John, who's gonna talk about Istio agent. Yeah, so I think the, the key to understanding uh, debugging the, the agent and Envoy is, is you really need to understand what it's doing. Um, so I wanted to first talk about what's happening when it starts up. Um, it's fairly common to see issues where people have misconfigurations or other things going on where things don't start up and they can't figure out why. Um, <clears throat> so as uh, Niraj mentioned, Istio agent is this component that's running alongside Envoy. Um, they actually run in the same container. And so it's basically like the lifecycle management and provides some uh, utilities on top of Envoy. So the first thing that happens when the pod starts up is we, we, we kick off Envoy and we get it running. Now, Envoy, in order to communicate with other services, it needs certificates. Um, this is used both to connect with other uh, microservices in your mesh and with eStudio D itself. And so the first thing it will do is it will request a certificate from the eStudio agent. Um, now, the eStudio agent will generate uh, a certificate and ask eStudio D to sign it. And it will authenticate itself using a JWT token. So these are present on Kubernetes pods with the service account token. Um, so the identity is bootstrapped for us by uh, Kubernetes out of the box. Um, so once we've done that, we'll give the certificate back to Envoy. And next we'll ask uh, Easter D for configuration and it will use that certificate that it returned to uh, authenticate itself. So if you see, for example, there's no config on my proxy it's possible it's having issues communicating with Easter D, and that could be because maybe it didn't get a certificate. So it's useful to make sure you understand the full flow so that you can see where the problems start. Um, if you go ahead to the next slide, we'll talk about the actual life cycle. So once we've bootstrapped, um, basically we're going to continue to do those two functions uh, throughout the life cycle. So Easter agent will monitor the certificates and when they're near expiration, it will ask uh, Istio D to sign a new one and push those to Envoy. At the same time, Istio D is watching uh, configuration and endpoints. And as they're changing, it's pushing new config to Envoy. Uh, so that's up to date. Uh, one thing that may also happen is we have uh, connection level parameters that have the max connection age and keep alive, et cetera, on this connection between Istio D and Envoy. And so it's not uncommon to see like disconnects between these which may appear to be an issue. Um, and it may be if it's happening you know, every two seconds or something. Uh, but if you see it happening every 30 minutes or every five minutes if there's no traffic, uh, which are the default max connection agent keep lives, it's very likely to be standard procedure. Um, so don't be too alarmed at that happening. Um, so that's pretty much the role of the agent. Um, if you go to the next slide, we'll talk about how we can uh, debug these. So the actual secrets that are loaded into Envoy um, can be viewed through Istio Cuddle. So we have this Istio Cuddle proxy config secret, and this will show a list of all the secrets loaded into Envoy. On a normal sidecar, you'll probably have two secrets. One is the default secret, which is the workload certificate for that uh, pod. This is how it's doing MTLS to other pods. And then there's also the root CA secret, which is the, the root certificate for the, the mesh. So there can also be other secrets that are, this is most common on the gateways where you have uh, certificates for terminating TLS. And so you could have a very long list there. Uh, and they can also be for destination rules for outbound traffic, but that's, that's generally less common. Um, so if you want to view the full certificate info, there's this fairly long, long command that basically just grabs the, 
uh, the certificate from the, that command and then passes it to OpenSSL, which will uh, decode the certificate. And so then you can see all the parameters of the certificate, like the expiration date, uh, the signer, uh, the SANS, et cetera. Um, so that can be really useful if you're having issues where the certificates aren't uh, working as expected. Uh, one other thing you may see is uh, what they call a warming secret. And this actually applies to all Envoy config. Um, so when something is warming, that basically means that Envoy is expecting to receive this configuration, uh, but it hasn't yet. So for example, if it asks uh, Istio agent for a certificate, uh, because the listener says we need the certificate to connect, it will go into a warming state until it's returned. And so if it's stuck warming, then traffic is going to fail until that, that uh, certificate arrives. So for example, if you have a gateway where you configure, I say, I want to use this secret uh, as a certificate and it doesn't exist, then it's very common for the secret to go into warming and Envoy and requests will fail. Um, so this is, if you're having issues here, it's good to look at the secret info and it will show if it's warming and then you can start uh, diagnosing from there. Uh, can you go ahead to the next slide? Yeah, so the Easter agent has its own readiness probe. Um, so this is pulling for, this is just a normal Kubernetes readiness probe. Uh, so this is pulling for the lifetime of the pod and it's checking the status here at uh, LC slash ready. And so if it succeeds, it will mark the container as ready and your pod will start receiving traffic. If it fails multiple times in a row, it will become not ready. Um, and one common misconception with the readiness probes in Kubernetes is that it's not just a startup. Uh, a pod can go from ready to not ready, which could be from you know, some issue with the pod uh, coming in later in life. So one of the, the common things you'll see is when we're not ready, we'll print out this log message, Envoy proxy is not ready. And if you see that, you know, for one second at startup, that's not a big issue. It just means that the startup's taking a little longer. Uh, but often we see, you know, it's happening forever and the pod never gets ready. Um, so at that point, we need to start digging it into a bit more. Um, the pod will not become ready until all the Envoy configuration is received. So if we can't connect to pilot, or sorry, Easter D, um, then this will never uh, come up. So one common case for this is rejected config. Um, this is basically when Istio D sends configuration uh, that is not considered valid by Envoy. Um, and so you'll see these logs both on the Envoy side and on the Istio D side. So you'll see on Istio D like this ACK error and on Envoy will say something, something, something is rejected and they will give a nice error message usually about what is the invalid config. Uh, there's also metrics for these which are the pilot XDS and then one of the resource types uh, rejects. So it's really good to monitor on these because usually these are indications of either non-standard or odd config um, or, and or a bug. Um, very likely it is an issue in the actual Istio code itself, uh, but it's triggered by doing something that's very strange that we have not considered before. Uh, so this is much less common now because <laughs> we've ran into a bunch of strange cases, but uh, it's still something to look out for because I can totally stop your pod from coming up. Um, so another issue can be connectivity issues to uh, Istio D. So you'll see maybe like uh, stream aggregate resources is the uh, connection, the gRPC uh, name. And so if it can't connect, then if you're having issues there, you may need to check that Istio D is running properly, that we have the certificates and check network level things like network policies and firewall rules are not preventing anything. Yep, go ahead to the next slide. Yeah, so next we'll talk about debugging Istio D itself. Uh, we'll talk about how to enable debug logging, view a dashboard for it, and some important metrics to, to look at. So Istio D has a lot of useful logs. I would say it is probably the, if you're running into issues, it's very easy to just quickly take a look at the logs and scan for any error warning messages. That can be a very quick way to find issues if there are any. Um, you can also enable debug logging um, if you need to go very in depth into an issue. This is uh, very, very noisy. So it's recommended only for uh, like point of time debugging, not running all the time. So this can be done at runtime by using this control Z dashboard. Uh, so if you run this Istio cuddle command, you'll get this UI where you can tweak some things. And I think in the next version of Istio, we're also adding an Istio cuddle command like the previous one that Niraj showed for Envoy. 
Uh, and you can also do it at install time, so that new pods coming up will be debug logging. Um, so this is a dashboard I briefly mentioned previously, which has a bunch of information about EastoD. You can see it's like things like memory info, environment variables, uh, metrics, that sort of thing. And so if you want to get a quick look at what's going on, uh, this can be a good place to get a bunch of info. And if you want to actually monitor like the metrics, you probably want, if you go to the next slide, uh, something like Prometheus or Stackdriver or some other tool that is actually aggregating these metrics over time because uh, the previous one is just a snapshot, which may not give you enough context. So Eastio comes with a set of Grafana dashboards uh, that are pre-populated with a bunch of useful metrics. Uh, there is specifically an Eastio D, or I think it's called the Eastio Control Plane Dashboard, which has basically all the info that we think is important for diagnosing the control plane. Uh, that's really one of the first places you can look. There's metrics for like the error rate, the number of pushes we're sending to Envoy, you know, the CPU, number of connections, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so it's really useful to take a look at that and really understand what's going on there so you are familiar with that. Um, there's a bunch of other metrics we expose as well that it would be way too long to discuss here. So I've linked to this deep dive by Datadog, which is extremely uh, thorough guide of all the metrics that Eastio exposes. I highly recommend taking a look at that, but I'll go over a couple uh, important ones here. So I mentioned this earlier, but the XDS rejects is important to understand uh, misconfigurations. If you have alerting, I uh, highly recommend putting an alert on this so that you understand when something's going wrong and you can immediately go fix it. Um, and another one is this metric proxy convergence time. This is the time between when EastUD gets an update from Kubernetes and that update is pushed to the proxies. So if this is very high, then you may see strange issues like uh, my proxy is sending connections to like old IP addresses that are no longer around, or it's not sending to new ones, uh, or it's not doing this new routing rule I applied, things like that. So typically this would be very, very quick, like 100 milliseconds, maybe a second in a larger mesh. If you start seeing things like five seconds, 10 seconds, even a minute, uh, it may indicate something's wrong or you have a very underscaled control plane. And then we also have one that spots the number of clients. So this can be useful if you have uh, to detect like an imbalanced load. Uh, and we'll talk about that more in, I think the next slide or soon. I uh, know soon. So <laughs> one other thing, this is probably like the last line of defense, but if you're having performance issues, both the control plane and data plane support profiling. Um, and if you're not familiar with this, basically it captures where memory and CPU is spent and it can produce these nice graphs here. Um, so this is highly recommended if you're having issues and you can even use this on your own applications if you're using Go or something else that supports this. Um, at the very least, I mean, this is very internal stuff really, but at the very least, if you're having issues with performance and you post an issue on GitHub with a profile, it is much, much easier for people to diagnose and make, get some movement there. So uh, can you go to the next slide? Yeah. yeah, so Easter Cuddle provides also cluster-wide uh, debugging. So we can see like proxy status uh, will show a list of all the connected uh, proxies and their status of each of the resources. Um, so I don't think we mentioned like CDS, LDS, EDS, and RDS. Those are the types in Envoy. So like the C stands for cluster, L is listener, E is endpoints, R is routes that Mirosh discussed previously. And so synced basically means that we've sent the config to Envoy and it's acknowledged that I received it. You may also see something like not sent. Um, not sent generally doesn't indicate an error. So it's very feasible for an egress gateway to not have any routes if we haven't defined any virtual services uh, that will create those routes. Uh, but if you may see something like not synced. If you see not synced, that means that we've sent Envoy the config but it hasn't acknowledged it. So Envoy may be overloaded, it may have uh, issues, something like that. So it's kind of an indicator that you should be looking into something. Uh, we also have a way to check for a specific config has been distributed uh, with this experimental command, eastocuddle wait. And so you can say apply a virtual service and then run the wait command and then not send traffic until it's actually been distributed. Um, we also have an analyzer. And so this is really, I think the first line of defense because it's so easy and can give uh, you know very obvious fixes for problems you're seeing. Uh, you basically run Eastio Cuddle Analyze. Uh, with dash A means all namespaces, so you analyze all the namespaces. 
And you can see common issues like, I'm creating a virtual service, but it's referencing a gateway that doesn't exist, or other uh, you know, cross-resource issues. So when you apply a config, it is validated, but it's just uh, validated against the schema in, in isolation. So Analyze can actually take your running Kubernetes cluster and analyze all the resources and compare them. So it's more of a global analysis, whereas the config validation is, is very isolated. And so we're trying to add, basically, anytime we see people running into issues, we try and add analyzers here. So it's kind of like the shared knowledge base. Um, we also have an experimental feature to start writing this into the status of objects, uh, which can be useful for other tooling or just uh, ease, of, ease of use. Uh, so we encourage you to try that out and give us feedback. Yeah, John, just a quick check. We are at 40 minute mark, so. All right, I will go extra fast. <laughs> no, I think you're going at the right pace. Just want to be aware of the timing. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so eStudio D can require a fair amount of scale depending on your cluster size. Um, fortunately, it's actually, it's fairly easy to scale. You can scale it horizontally or vertically vertically uh, and it will you know it will work just as well uh, it's it's pretty important to make sure that you don't have uh, the CPU limit being hit I've seen before like uh, it's pegged at the high CPU limit and then that leads to slow updates which leads to weird failures downstream uh, so make sure that it has enough CPU if it doesn't then raise the limit or scale out um, and I also highly recommend if possible using the latest version because we've had some substantial performance improvements so a lot of issues I've seen could have been fixed just by upgrading. And basically, there's three factors that impact eStudio D scaling. Uh, the first one is the size of the config we generate. So for every Envoy proxy, we generate config about you know, the endpoints, routes, listeners. And so as that grows larger and larger, it's more and more expensive to generate. And this is impacted by the number of resources and services, because you know, for each virtual service, we generate these routes. For each service, we generate all these different clusters, et cetera. And so if you do have a large scale, uh, you should really consider using the sidecar, which can scope down the resources. So you can say things like, this pod only needs to access other services in this, the same namespace. And so don't bother sending config for the entire mesh, which may be huge. Uh, if you have a large cluster, it's, it's almost uh, required. Uh, the other one is the rate of change. If you have new services every second, then we're pushing updates every second, which is uh, extremely expensive. Uh, but adding new endpoints is much cheaper because we have an optimized code path there. So in a normal steady state production cluster, you may just have endpoints coming up and down from auto scaling, but no actual configuration pushes. And so one thing that this actually impacts is that oftentimes people's development clusters require far higher scale on eStudio D, but the production cluster is actually very small. Uh, so that's one thing to watch out for. And the other thing is just the number of proxies. Uh, as there's more proxies, there's more config to generate, more things to connect to. Uh, so that obviously impacts the scale as well. Um, so I briefly mentioned this. One issue we see people having is an unbalanced load to eStudio D. This is because the connection is this long-lived gRPC stream, which makes load balancing uh, fairly challenging. Because if you have all the connections to a single pod and then a new instance comes up, nothing's connecting to the new one. Uh, so we do have some slow rebalancing because of the max connection age. Uh, but generally, like, this may cause issues where we scale up a new pod, and then the horizontal pod autoscaler realizes it's not getting much load, so it removes it, and then it adds it again, and it's just kind of this endless cycle. So we recommend having at least two replicas to alleviate this, and that's just uh, good practice in general for high availability. Yeah, that's great, John. I uh, think I can do this in the remaining ones. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. That was great. So one of the common problems that we see is uh, users struggle with understanding mutual TLS and how does the client and the server relate to each other specifically to these configuration objects. So here is a summary of what it is. So destination rule is always affecting the client side. It tells you what type of traffic is sent and peer authentication tells what the server will accept. So there are three modes here. A destination rule disable means the client will send plain text. This is normal only for services outside the mesh in the with services within the mesh or workloads in your cluster you want to make sure you have encrypted traffic because of service uh, because of adding the sidecar proxy right uh, the second mode is is mutual in which the sidecar proxy will send mutual tls traffic and upgrade that 
connection to a TLS connection automatically. And the other modes are simple and mutual, which can be used to originate TLS. The difference between the Istio mutual and simple mutual is in Istio mutual, the certificates and the keys are managed automatically by the Istio control plane. Uh, in the peer authentication, similar modes are if it is disabled, the server will only accept plain text. If it is strict, the server will accept only mutual TLS and per main server, it can accept MTLS or plain text. So it's critical to understand what you're trying to achieve here. So if you're trying to do a migration, then you might be able to do permissive, but you really want to lock down your production environment, you might want strict. So the next thing is how all of this interacts and works with auto MTLS. So auto MTLS was a feature that was added in, uh, in the last two releases to enable users to migrate easily because we're seeing problems when users turned on mutual TLS. Sometimes the traffic worked because the client or the server had misconfigurations. So with auto MTLS, this is how we decide what traffic to send. If there's a destination rule, then the destination rule configures, the, the destination rule configuration is always used. The second thing is if the server has a sidecar and the peer authentication allows mutual TLS, then we send mutual TLS. Peer authentication is hierarchical. So if it can adopt, it can, if it doesn't have a specific peer authentication to the workload, it might be that the global one is used. And the last is if there is, if none of those rules match, we'll send plain text traffic. So this helps you in migration, but at the same time, it can mean that sometimes the traffic is plain text if the first two rules don't match. So if you're using auto MTLS, you have to be careful on what you're trying to enforce as an organizational policy. So this is the troubleshooting guide that uh, John and I were talking about. In my opinion, this is how you should start when you see issues in production. First, like John said, use Istio CTL Analyze. It's a great tool to understand holistically if there are configuration issues which don't, where the resources don't work well with each other, they are conflicting. Then look at Istio CTL proxy status. This gives you a quick view of if any of the sidecar proxies have not received configuration or have not acknowledged that the recent configuration has been received. The third is Istio D logs. This gives you if there are common errors or if, if Istio D in the control plane is not behaving correctly. So at this point, these three things tell you about common misconfigurations or issues with your control plane. The fourth one is looking at access logs. So you're looking now at the sidecar access logs to understand if the traffic is failing, why the traffic is failing. Looking at the response flags, like I was saying before, gives you an idea about the errors. The fifth step for me is always looking at onward configuration. And that's why we went into details about how to understand the onward configuration architecture. This is the uh, source of truth for actually understanding what is going to happen to your traffic because eventually Istio is responsible for configuring onward. And if you look at the onward configuration and understand it, you can be sure of what will happen to your traffic. The next is looking at Istio D metrics. Some of the metrics that John talked about give you a lot of information about errors and why you're seeing slowness in your control pin responsiveness. The seventh is for me, turning on debug logging, you can turn on debug logging at the control plane or at the envoy if you're not able to understand what's going on. And the last tool in your toolkit is profiling. If you don't need to do this yourself, if you have the profile, and like John said, if you create a GitHub issue, we will help you diagnose it. But this is the last thing that normally when we can't make sense of it, we ask because this can give you some important things around if, so for example, your STD is logged in production and you are having some races around mutexes that we hold. So this is the summary of all the debugging capabilities that we have. The last slide here is about having a production Istio installation. So normally users are trying Istio by installing a demo profile. Some of these settings are already in the production profile, but John and I, we just wanted to highlight these things so that when you use Istio in production, you are aware that these are the changes that you should have, or these are the things that you should enable so you can run and diagnose Istio successful in production. First is to making sure you're gathering metrics and logs. John pointed to uh, the Grafana dashboard and the Datadog blog. So always make sure you are collecting those metrics, looking at those time series data and have alerts on the important metrics. I highly recommend enabling access logs. Understanding your outboard traffic control is super critical whether you want to control access and limit what external services can you talk to 
do you want to use the registry only option or do you want to use an egress proxy in production? My recommendation is to always use an egress gateway or a proxy for correct authorization uh, enforcement. A strict MTLS instead of auto is another one of those things. You can use auto for migration, but if you your prime objective is to ensure all traffic is encrypted, you should enable strict MTLS. You have at least two STOD pods running. You can configure HPA. If you start with two STOD control pods, you always have some resiliency. At the same time, you might get away with the problem of pods coming up and down and having a massively misbalanced uh, load for the STODs. Uh, I also recommend configuring pod anti-affinity so that if one of the nodes goes down, your STOD pod is still available. STO out of the box will create a self-signed root certificate to bootstrap the system. In production, you want to make sure you have a certificate which will sign by a trusted CA, whatever CA you are using. Uh, the ingress ports that are by default configured are very generous and there are a lot of ingress ports that are open. Depending on your organizational policies, you should make sure you have only the ports that you need for external traffic access. I recommend using sidecar injection, the automatic sidecar injection instead of manual. This is again governed by your organizational policies where you can say, I want all of my pods or all of these namespaces to have pods with sidecars so there cannot be any policy escapes. And the last is if you're relying on Prometheus and Jaeger for tracing and telemetry, you need to have a production grade installation. What comes with Istio is a demo version and not from production grade. So we all we have issues sometimes users coming to us and saying uh, how to manage and control Prometheus. Now we give you a demo version, but the production ready version has to be maintained by you. Look at the best practices for how to do that. So with that, I think we are at the end of our presentation. So we are going to move on to uh, questions. Do we have any, Jerry? Yes, we do. Um... Sab Malik would like to know, what are the common ITSO and Envoy issues observed in running clusters? Sorry, can you repeat that again? <clears throat> um, Sab Malik wants to know, what are the common ISO and Envoy issues observed in running clusters? John, you wanna go for it? Yeah, I, I'd say the one of the most common I see is uh, misconfigurations where you are configuring you know, a set of gateways, virtual services, destination rules, and you expect it to do one thing, but it's actually doing something slightly different. <clears throat> so this is hopefully getting better over time as we improve the documentation and APIs, uh, but it's still fairly common. And so this is where debugging the Envoy configuration can be invaluable. Uh, if you're able to actually see, the, like the Envoy configuration is the lowest level, so oftentimes you can quickly see like, oh, this is routing, to, the completely wrong place, and then figure out where uh, the disconnect happened. Uh, you could also use ETO cuddle analyze if it's a semantic issue, like referencing something that doesn't exist. Uh, so to me, that's that's really the most common is is misconfigurations. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Do you have any other ones, Niraj? Uh, no, I was going to say the same to ETO CTL analyze and misconfigurations and looking at the Envoy configuration. Uh, the other thing which I've seen is the load that Envoy that Jod talked about. So depending on your production load, if your STUD is not able to handle it, you will see some slowness or you might see failures. So it's good to keep a track on those metrics and accordingly scale your control plane out. So is there any other question, Jerry? Uh, yes. Uh, super, uh, super corn says, do I need to enable some configuration in Istio before I can access control Z? I had tried to access controls, but it seems to have an error on startup. Uh, that's a good question. As far as I know, you don't need a special option to enable it. It is enabled by default, but because it is relying on your cube config, you might not have the correct permissions given to you by your cluster admin to actually exec into a pod and issue those commands or port forward. Uh, John, is that correct? Yeah, it should be there by default. If you're having issues, uh, feel free to open the issue on GitHub and we can take a, take a closer look. And another question we have here. <clears throat> um, are there any performance concerns on enabling access logs in Envoy? Uh, really good question. I don't 
So personally, I like access logs. I think uh, they have a lot of rich information and compared to debug logging, they are only based on the transactions. Secondly, Envoy handles writing to files as in this case, we should be doing to standard out in a performant way. It does not block the worker threads. It is handled on the master, on the primary thread itself. So I don't see a lot of issues, but if you are seeing some specific performance issues, we'll be interested in diagnosing. Uh, John, do you, have you seen them? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's definitely some overhead as with any yeah. sort of telemetry feature. Um, for most people, it's worth it. If you have mm -hmm. an extremely high performance uh, application, in that case, it may not be. But for, for most cases, I'd, it's usually worth it. But, you know, telemetry is always a trade off with performance. Yeah. And you can always scope it down to a namespace if, that, if it comes to it. But I would recommend turning it on globally and diagnosing and seeing if you actually have problems. Okay. And Jin Dong Lee wants to know, is Istio agent running in its own container? Yeah, so there's the Istio proxy sidecar, which is a, an image and container that runs alongside every pod. This contains both the Istio agent and Envoy in the same container. And so they're two different processes. And the Istio agent starts up first, and then it uh, spins off the Envoy process. Is there a simple way to configure access for logging error only for for log all four, five, but not 200? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. There is no simple way. Uh, it is possible, I think, through the Envoy filters. Um, I believe that we're working on adding like a more native telemetry and access logging API that hopefully we'll be able to do this. Um, we can probably point to, I think we have an example somewhere of doing this. I can see if we can add this to uh, Niraj's GitHub where he posted the samples for the access logs we showed here. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we will make it better in the upcoming releases. Currently, you're stuck with Envoy filter. And how can you go about debugging CNI issues? Ah, that's a really good question. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> they are, for me, really, really tricky to do. And depending on your CNI provider, what you're using and your platform, it can be even more tricky. Uh, for the, the thing that I have used is logging, looking at the CNI daemon set logging to see what's happening. That's the first level of defense. Most of the time when there are CNI issues, you will see that the pod will not even come up because you will have uh, health Z failures as far as I know. So if you have CNI enabled and if you see health Z issues, that's a good indication that there's something, uh, there's a mismatch in the setup itself, which is not enabling CNI to do its job. Is there anything else, John, that we can do in CNI? I don't remember if there are metrics that we expose. Uh, no, right now it's it's not the most uh, the greatest experience, but we're working on promoting CNI to beta, and most yeah. of that work is around supportability and debugging. Uh, Absolutely, so hopefully this will improve shortly. Yeah. And if you if whoever asked this question, if you are seeing issues and you're not able to diagnose them, please create a GitHub issue so we can add it in our list of things to make CNI beta and make make it more debuggable. And John, this one's for you specifically. What uh, justifies getting headless services into service mesh? Um, I'm not sure I 100% understand the question. Uh, headless services sh should be supported uh, by Istio. We had, did have some issues in older versions, but on newer versions, it should mostly be resolved. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that was the question or something else. I think, John, they're asking, what's the benefit of adding a stateless service to the mesh? Oh, I see. Yeah, I, I'd say it's, um, you know, the benefits for headless services are the same as other ones. We get telemetry, routing, uh, policies out of the box. And, you know, that's useful for stateless and stateful services. Um, so the benefits really apply, apply to both. Exactly. And the difference is primarily in sta most of the stateless services, the application is taking care of picking the destination and load balancing. But you still want the network enforcement, the encryption, and uh, policies that John talked about, and the telemetry. And now here's another question. We are working in environments where we are stuck with older Istio versions and legacy services we need to make work. Compatibles redirect rules often cause a lot of headaches, sidecar, ending up stealing traffic it cannot handle. When you also put in MTLS into equation, into equations, they become very hectic. Uh, 
Do you have any, any check recipes or checklists on how to make containers or apps play well with Sidecar? Uh, I think uh, there is a bit of uh, fine tuning and learning here. So we have uh, annotations that you can add on pod level where you can specifically specify which ports to include or exclude, including IP ranges. So you can use that if you a priori know that this protocol is legacy or this port should not be handled by, uh, by the sidecar. Second thing is, uh, if you are not sure about your environment, which has a mix of legacy and non-legacy, you can start without MTLS, use auto MTLS, figure out if your traffic is actually working with MTLS enabled and then make it strict. Uh, those are the two things which I have uh, helped with customers. The third one can be uh, protocol detection. I normally recommend labeling the services port prefixes with explicit protocols. And if you don't know your protocol or if you're unaware of you haven't done it, it will by default use TCP. So in that case, the traffic should work, but you might not get a lot of rich telemetry. These are the three things that I've seen people have trouble with. John, you have more, or you can use as a migration tool. Uh, no, that, that pretty much covers it. But I would say definitely if you have a complicated environment where you can't just plop Istio in and things work, uh, which is the goal, and we're hoping that that does work, uh, highly recommend incrementally adopting. So mm -hmm. you know, add an ingress gateway, add a sidecar to some pods, add sidecars to other pods at MTLS. Uh, Etc. Don't just try and go in all in with Istio because there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, so you want to make sure that you're doing it slowly and making sure you're understanding. Yeah, good question. All right. Well, unfortunately, we're at the top of the hour and we cannot take any more questions at this time. Um, I want to thank John Narash for a wonderful presentation. And as I said before, today's webinar and slides will be available later today on the CNCF website. Thank you all again for a great presentation and see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all.